Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit now about um, ray constant and rate of reaction as a function of temperature. And again, this is all probably, most of you know this already, or all of you probably do. But if we look at ethyl chloride giving us ethylene and hydrochloric acid, and we measure the rate of reaction, or the rate constant for reaction, at different temperatures, you can see that the rate constant changes by a factor of five if we go from 700 to 727, and it changes by another factor of eight if we go from 727 to 765 Kelvin. So it's highly dependent on temperature. And so a rule of thumb, the rate approximately doubles for a 10K rise in temperature. And so I'll do a little thing later where uh, we see what is the activation energy or thing. So I'm sort of let, letting the cat out of the bag. So the rate is highly dependent on temperature, and it's exponentially dependent. So if we go back, <clears throat> Hood in 1878 proposed that the rate of reaction was equal to uh, a frequency factor A, some constant A, times the exponent of minus B over T. So it had a, he had a two-parameter uh, but again, he, he knew that it was exponentially dependent on temperature, okay? And Arrhenius in 1899 said, okay, the rate constant is actually equal to A, the frequency factor, times the exponent of minus an activation energy over RT, okay? Where R was the gas constant, okay? A is be an exponential uh, factor, or A factor, and the rate constant at, at Temperature goes to infinity, or, okay? And it's, sorry, is it, the rate of reaction, or A is equal to the rate constant as the temperature goes to infinity, okay? Trying to say, okay. So E is the activation energy expressed in joules per mole, or typically I express it actually in kilocalories per mole, or calories per mole. Um, or it can be just as a temperature, an activation temperature. So Hood actually had essentially the right equation. We call it the Arrhenius equation, but he had it as a, an activation temperature all over T, okay? And then Arrhenius realized that it was an activation energy times all over R, the gas constant times T. Okay, so if we look at the, the rate, uh, rate of reaction, which is actually, we'd say the rate constant versus temperature, Okay, it's proportional to rate constant versus temperature because the concentrations are changing. We see for three different reactions, we've got a magenta line, a blue line, and a green line. We can see here that actually the activation energy for the magenta reaction and the blue reaction, the activation energies are about the same, but the frequency factor for the magenta one is a bit higher than it is for the blue one. So both of them are starting to react at the same temperature, but the rate of reaction for this one is faster than for the blue one, okay? And again, it's a little bit higher, or a, a little, it's very similar for the green one, but the frequency factor, again, is about the same as the blue, okay? But it reaches a temperature where it reaches a max, then it, it sort of um, asymptotes out, and then, completely decreases. So what would this be for? Pardon? No. It's, it's probably some sort of a biological reaction. So you asked, is it to do with the pre-exponential factor? No, it's to do with, it's to do with we've, killed, we've killed the reactant, okay? So some sort of bio biological process where We've increased the temperature so much that we've actually killed it, and it won't react anymore, okay? <laughs> so that's all that, that is there, okay? But it's just interesting, some sort of biological process, okay? So Arrhenius, the Arrhenius equation then, we have the rate constant is equal to A times the exponent of minus E over RT. But it, it, it's very useful in the linear form. So if we say log, of k is equal to log a minus e a over r times one over t. Then we can say, right, well, if we plot 
a graph of log k on the y-axis versus 1 over temperature on the x-axis, we should get a straight line, the slope of which is minus Ea over R, and the y-intercept is log A. And so if we measure then a reaction, the rate of reaction, and, and thus measure the rate constant at different temperatures, and we then plot the log of the rate constant versus 1 over T, we can back out what the activation energy is and what the frequency factor is, the A and the Ea. Okay? And we then will be able to tell at any temperature in which this is linear what the rate of reaction should be. Well, the rate constant or the rate. Okay? And so, again, if we go back to our example here, then what we would do is we plot log of the rate constant on the y-axis versus 1 over t on the x-axis, and we can get the Arrhenius parameters for this process. Okay? So maybe this evening, when you're doing nothing else, okay, you could try and do that. That's your homework. That's the big homework you have to do this evening. It should take all of about a minute to do. Okay? But work out what is the frequency factor and the activation energy for this reaction in this range. Okay? So just try that, please. Okay, there's one thing I, I, I have here, actually, on the bottom of this slide. Again, it's for the, the, uh, the undergrad students that I teach in Galway. But there's, if you go to this Wikipedia page on the cherry blossom front in Japan, the cherry blossom is a very important uh, tree to the Japanese people. And it, there's an equation that can be used to predict when the cherry blossom is going to blossom in your part of the country, in Japan. But essentially, it's an Arrhenius-type equation. And it, it is, it comes from reactivity. So if you see, I, I, you're, a lot of you are, or all of you, or most of you are doing graduate courses now. And if you look at your counterparts in biochemistry or microbiology, they're using these fridges that are down at minus 80. Why, what's the point in, in having a fridge at minus 80? Surely, if you just freeze at below zero, it'll hold, okay? But again, the rate of reactivity of the bugs, or whatever, is dependent on the Arrhenius equation. The lower the temperature, the lower the reactivity, because the activation energy barrier associated with reactivity, if you lower the temperature um, quite a lot, or if we go to this equation again, if we lower the temperature, then this exponent really lowers the rate constant and then lowers the reactivity. And that's why it does make a difference whether you have a fridge at minus, or at zero, or minus four, or something, or minus 80. The reactivity is going to decrease exponentially due to that lower temperature. And again, um, in Ireland, Probably you didn't hear about it much, and I, but I talked to my undergrads there. In Ireland a few years ago, we had a really cold, and I think it happened maybe across the world, actually, in North America also, and, and certainly in Europe. We had a really cold spring. And um, in April, the farmers ran out of fodder. So the grass didn't grow. They weren't allowed, they weren't, the, the farmers weren't able to put the cattle and the sheep and whatever out on grass out onto the land. They had to keep them indoors and feed them still. And actually, the farmers ran out of fodder. And we had to import fodder from England and from France and in um, Europe um, because the grass didn't grow because the temperature was too low. So the, every, it has implications, practical implications, uh, for farmers and so on, grass growth and so on. And again, it all depends on the Arrhenius equation. So a nice, a nice uh, thing to look at on Wikipedia is just, if you go to that site, the equation is an Arrhenius-type equation for the, for the cherry blossom in Japan. OK, so, so we have, then with this equation, if we plot log of, so, all, all we, so if we think about kinetics then, if we study the rate of decay of, uh, and I actually haven't got it here, and maybe I should go back, I, I go back and do it. If we study the rate, if we have A plus B reacting to give us C plus D, okay? We study, the, 
the rate of decay of A keeping B constant. We can determine whether the rate of react reaction is first order or second order with respect to A. Okay? And then we keep um, A constant and we look at B and we can determine the dependence of B. Okay? And then we have the expression for the, the rate law. So we have rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A to the alpha times B to the beta. Okay? Um, I lost my train of thought. Okay. So, so then we have the Arrhenius expression for um, the, the, the rate constant is equal to whatever it is in terms of A factor and activation energy. Okay? And then we can calculate the rate at any temperature because we know the dependence of the species and we know the rate constant. Okay, so here we have different activation energies and the range from zero to 400 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so here for instance, we have H reacting with HCl the bond strength is actually quite low, and the, the, the um, activation energy is 19 kilojoules per mole. Fluorine, there's a stronger FH bond or HF bond, and the activation energy is 139. Here, uh, ethyl iodide, giving us ethylene plus hydrogen iodide, it's a relatively low activation energy, 209 kilojoules per mole. And here we have ethane giving us two methyl radicals. So what's happening here in this reaction? We we're breaking the CC bond in ethane. So that CC bond strength is actually 368 kilojoules per mole. That's the bond association energy required to break that CC bond. Okay. And here's a practical plot then. We plot log of rate constant versus 1 over T. Again, the slope is equal to minus Ea over R. So the activation energy in this plot then, it's 188 kilojoules per mole. And the y-intercept is 27.6. And again, you can see actually, well, the y-intercept here is actually seven. How could it be 27.6? But I always remind my undergrads, remember that the y-intercept is that x is equal to zero. So here, the x is 0 0.0009, so it's not zero. So zero is way off over here, which is 27.6. So just be, be careful with that. And so it's, the frequency factor then is 1.1 times 10 to the 12 decimeter cube per mole per second in this example. Okay. Okay. So here's just a, a little example or a little problem. And there's a little point to this. So in consecutive reactions, the slower step usually determines the overall rate of reaction. So for diethyl adipate, and I changed the numbers here slightly, but anyway, from thing. So we assume the first step, diethyl adipate. Has a, some, goes to some sort of an intermediate B and then goes on to products. And the first step has a, a rate constant which has this expression, 3.6 times 10 to the 6 times the exponent of minus 5,000 all over T. And the second step has this expression, 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 5 times the exponent of minus 4,000 all over T. Okay, so the first one has a faster frequency factor but a higher activation energy, okay? And the second step has a lower frequency factor, but a lower activation energy. So which one is faster and at which temperature, okay? So, well, let's look at them plotted, and it's on the next slide, okay? So the question is, which step is rate determining if the reaction is carried out in aqueous solution at atmospheric pressure and of course, you need to ask at which temperature, okay? This isn't what the question asks, but that's, that's the ultimate question, at which temperature, okay? So if we plot then the two expressions, here we have the first blue one and the second red one, you can see that at low temperature, so this is 
we, this is low temperature here. This is 250, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 Kelvin. Okay? So this is 1 over T. You can see that this expression is faster up to about 800 Kelvin or so. And then this expression becomes faster above that. And I, I show that deliberately. It's calculated deliberately. Okay? So it depends very much on what temperature you're at, how the activation energy and the frequency factor affect you. So remember that the ray constant is exponentially dependent on the activation energy all over T. Okay? So it depends on what the activation energy bar barrier is and what temperature you're at. Right? And that's the very important thing. So once you get to very high temperatures, right, it really depends. This becomes less and less important, the temperature, activation energy temperature dependent part becomes less and less important. And what really is important then is the frequency factor. Okay? And so the blue one is bigger than the red one, and so at high temperatures, the blue one is faster. Right? But at low temperatures, then your activation energy barrier is very important. Okay? And that's really, even though you know, this is only four-fifths of this one, it's much, much faster at lower temperature than the other one. Okay? So that's just showing you the effect of the frequency factor and the activation energy. Okay? And it's in the mathematical equation, but uh, just, to, just to bear that in mind. Now, why is this important? Um, one example that I can think of straight away, and typically I don't see it under combustion relevant conditions, but in high temperature pyrolysis can be important. So if we consider unimolecular fuel decomposition, I spoke earlier about um, isooctane or ethane even. You can break the CC bond or you can break the CH bond. Okay? Typically, under combustion relevant conditions, only CC bond breaking occurs in a hydrocarbon molecule. CH bond breaking doesn't compete because the activation energy for CH bond breaking is much higher than the, the bond association energy for CC bond breaking. Okay? You're talking about 420 kilojoules per mole as opposed to 368, we'd say, in the case of um, ethane. And so, but at very high temperatures over 2,000 Kelvin, CH bond breaking st can start to compete and dominate because the frequency factor for CH bond breaking is about an order of magnitude higher than that for CC bond breaking. So typically, if, if we have a CC bond breaking, we have a frequency factor of about 10 to the 13. But for CH bond breaking, it's about 10 to the 14. So you have an order of magnitude faster uh, frequency factor. All right. Okay. So I said at the start of this, typically a rule of thumb is that the rate of reaction increases by a factor of two for every 10k rise in temperature. Well, that is dependent on your what temperature you're at and what activation energy you have. Okay. So let's try and work out what it is. What is the activation energy for which this is true if you go from 20 degrees C to 30 degrees C? Okay? So the question is, what is the activation energy of a reaction for which the rate constant doubles on going from 20 degrees C to 30 degrees C? I should have activation energy there. Okay? So we have, th this is the Arrhenius expression. Then we have the the relative rate constant. So if we put rate constant 1 at, the, at temperature 1 is equal to A e to the minus E A over RT1. And then rate constant at 2 is equal to A e to the minus E A over RT2. Right? And we put one over the other, then we have the rate constant at T1, all of the rate constant at T2 is equal to the frequency factors cancel, and we have the exponent of minus E A over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2, right? And then we can say, well, log of K1 over K2 is minus Ea over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2, okay? Anyway, if it doubles going from 
20 degrees C to 30 degrees C, we put in our numbers, our values, and we have minus 0.693 is equal to all this. Then we had come up with an activation energy of 51.2 kilojoules per mole. Okay? So, and that is typically for biological processes. The activation energy is about 45 to 55 kilojoules per mole. So, when, as chemists, not kinesis now, but chemists, we say, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was told, okay, the ray constant are double for every 10K rise in temperature. They were considering a process which had an activation energy of about 50 kilojoules per mole and going from room temperature up 10 degrees and so on. Okay? And of course, this isn't going to be true. If you're at a higher temperature, it'll, it'll change by a different amount and so on. Okay? Because of the exponential dependence. Okay, so now remember I said earlier that kinetics and thermodynamics, or sorry, kinetics and equilibrium are linked via thermodynamics. So this is the link. Okay, so say we have a reaction at equilibrium, then A is in equilibrium with B. Then we know the, the our, and we have a forward rate constant K forward and reverse rate constant K reverse. Then the then we know that the rate constant in the forward direction times the concentration of A at equilibrium is equal to the rate constant in the reverse direction times the concentration of B at equilibrium. So we have the concentration of B at equilibrium over the concentration of A at equilibrium is going to be equal to K forward over K reverse, and that's equal to the equilibrium constant, KEQ. Okay? And if we, if we then write k forward is equal to a forward e to the minus e forward over rt, and k reverse is equal to a reverse e to the minus e reverse over rt, then we have the equilibrium constant kq is equal to k forward over k reverse, and that's equal to a forward over a reverse times the exponent of minus e forward minus e reverse over rt. Okay? But, okay, if we considered, so that's kq, but from equilibrium, or thermodynamics, I should say, the standard Gibbs free energy is equal to minus RT log K, log equilibrium constant, or the equilibrium constant is, exponent, is the exponent of minus delta G all over RT. And we know that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay, so we know then that the equilibrium constant is equal to the expon exponent of delta S over R times the exponent of minus delta H over RT. Okay? But we know also that the equilibrium is equal to A forward over A reverse times the exponent of minus E forward or minus E reverse over RT. So this and this are equal. So then, if that's true, then we know that A forward over A reverse is equal to the exponent of delta S over R and E forward minus E reverse is equal to delta H of reaction. Okay? And hence, if we know the ray constant in the forward direction, and we know the thermodynamic parameters are all, of all the species involved in the reaction, through the equilibrium constant, we can calculate K reverse at any temperature. Okay? And that's what Kemkin does. And that's why we need the thermodynamic parameters of all the species in Kemkin so that we can calculate the reverse rate constant and allow all the reactions to occur. And so we can calculate net rates of reaction, forward and reverse, to get the net rate. Okay. Um, so again, and you can see now how, again, my analogy of, about going from this side of the room to the other side of the room. The rate at which I go from one side of the room to the other depends on my entropy change and on the activation energy. Depends on the frequency factor and on the activation energy for reaction. Sorry, the entropy change or the enthalpy, I should have said. Or frequency factor and activation energy. It's the same thing, ultimately. So now you can see clearly that the frequency factor 
is associated with entropy change. And the activation energy is associated with enthalpy change. Makes perfect sense. And again, if a reaction is to occur, the reaction for me to go, how fast I go over, depends on how fast I'm running and also whether there's this big rostrum in my way reaching the other side of the room. Okay? So it's perfectly logical. Okay, and this is just an associated problem then. So you can use data to calculate first rate constants from forward rate constants. Okay? So for the reaction trans to cis per fluorobutuene, the measured rate constant in the forward direction has this frequency factor and activation temperature, but it's an activation energy essentially. Given that the heat of reaction is 3.42 kilojoules per mole, and the entropy change for reaction is minus 2.03 joules per degree Kelvin per mole, calculate K reverse at 750 Kelvin. And you can, we, we just look, A forward over A reverse is equal to the exponent of delta S over R. We know A forward is 3.16 times 10 to the 13. We know delta S, so we can calculate A reverse. Okay? And another, that's another homework for tonight, okay? Another minute of your time to calculate A reverse. And then E forward over E re minus E reverse is equal to delta H. E reverse is calculated for you here. So if you just get A reverse, um, you'll have the reverse, K, re K reverse, the expression for that, both the A and the EA. Okay. So now if we look at reaction profile diagrams, and this actually, if you want to write here, you could ha have N, NC3H7 or C2H5, any radical, C2H5, NC3H7, IC3H7, anything, PC4H9. So if you, had, if you write uh, NC3H7 here, we can have C2H4 plus CH3 here, okay? And typically, we, when we look at reactions, we consider these reaction profile diagrams, right? And what we plot on the y-axis is an energy. And on the x-axis, we put the reaction coordinate. So for a reaction to occur, we have, in this case, we have NC3H7 here starting out. It has to go through some sort of a, a transition. Okay, so if we have NC3H7, we have um, a radical bonded to a carbon, then a carbon, and then another carbon. Right? And then it has to essentially reach some sort of a transition where the, if I write it here, where did I put the other marker? It's here. So the system starts out like this, but then it has to become Okay, and in so doing, what happens is this, the, this bond is just two electrons, right? We have an electron here, an electron here. And so what has to happen is this carbon-carbon bond has to stretch, okay? And the more this stretches, the higher the energy um, that has to be put in to draw the two carbons away from one another, okay? And so we have to reach this point of transition. And then once they, they're, they're so far apart, essentially this electron moves in here and we create the double bond, the pi bond, okay? And now it relaxes back to ethylene plus methyl, okay? And so that's what this diagram depicts, okay? So we could draw, if we wanted to, what, typically what all we do is we write NC3H7 here, and we write C2H4 plus CH3 here. But we could actually draw 
imaginary, well, are real, not imaginary, but actually real molecules or real structures along this path, depicting the, the actual structure of the NC3H7 as it approaches breaking the CC bond, generating ethylene plus methyl, all the way up until we reach this transition state. And the transition state would look something just as it transitions from this structure to this one. So it would probably look some, something more like this, with the carbon way out here, but it's still just about bound to this other carbon. That's, that's an extreme depiction. Okay, that's an extreme depiction, but it's just to accentuate. And then it just transitions over into ethylene plus methyl. Okay, anyway, this is referred to as a, a reaction co coordinate diagram. Okay. On the x-axis, we actually um, put in the reaction product identity, okay, along here. Okay, and it gives some sort of, it's a schematic diagram, essentially, that gives us the concept of the energy barrier for reaction and what's going on, okay? And you can see now, if we look at this, here's the energy barrier in the forward direction, here's the energy barrier in the reverse direction, and here's delta H of reaction. And we can see that the, the reaction is endothermic in the forward direction or exothermic in the reverse direction. And not today, but in subsequent lectures during the week, I'll be talking about how we estimate rate constants for reactions like any radical decomposing to give a smaller olefin and a smaller radical species. And typically, we look at these reactions in the reverse direction. It was actually Professor Bozzelli taught me this many years ago, okay? Where we, we look and say, right, well, we have ethylene plus methyl reacting. We have this energy barrier in the reverse direction, and then produces NC387, okay? But typically for a methyl radical, adding to a CC double bond in ethylene or adding to the external double bond in propene or butene or any larger olefin, the activation energy barrier is typically about eight kilocalories per mole. Uh, I use maybe a bit 7.8, 7, 7 but eight kilocalories per mole, okay? And so this barrier height doesn't normally change, okay? There's an activation energy barrier for a methyl radical adding across a double bond, CC double bond. Now, it does change depending on whether it's an external carbon atom in a CC double bond or an internal carbon atom. And what do I mean by that? So, if we have, I'll be doing this later in the week, so don't, don't worry about it for now. So here, if we look at it here, we have methyl adding to this carbon or this carbon. But in the case of ethylene, the carbon is always external, okay? But think, think about something like propene. We have C double bond C, C plus CH3, okay? And now the methyl radical can add to this carbon or it can add to this carbon. Okay, if it adds to the terminal carbon, then we get a S secondary pro butyl radical. If it adds to this carbon, we get terp butyl radical. Okay, we get two different. And the activation energy barrier for terminal addition is typically lower than the barrier for addition to the internal carbon atom. This one increases by about 1.5 calories kilocalories per mole, okay? But anyway, if we look, at, if we look in the literature and we, we do an analysis, we see that the activation energy barrier for any methyl or ethyl or propyl or any radical adding to the terminal carbon in an olefin typically has an activation energy barrier of about eight kilocalories per mole. It's very consistent, okay? But the barrier 
for in the forward direction depends on delta H of reaction. And that delta H of reaction is dependent on the thermochemistry of the species. So it, it changes a lot. So if we look at this reaction in the endothermic direction, it's hard to get a good rule of thumb what ray constant to use. And this is what was explained to me by Professor Belzelli many years ago. So the way we look at these reactions is actually in the reverse exothermic direction. So you may see in, in the mechanisms that we produce in Galway and produce in Livermore, we'll write these reactions as the, in the reverse direction. Ethylene plus methyl giving us N-propyl radical, or iso whatever we're producing, N-propyl. And then we allow the thermochemistry to calculate the ray constant in the, the other direction. So N-propyl giving us back ethylene plus methyl. Okay. And then we have a rule of thumb for rate rules. And I'll be talking about rate rules in other lectures during the week. OK. Now, this is just complicated, but it's, it's just simple. Thing. And you've come across this before, where if we, if we look at the reaction of acetaldehyde giving methane plus CO, the activation energy in, the, in this direction, again, this is actually uh, exothermic, is 198 kilojoules per mole. Okay, But if we add some iodine as a catalyst, the activation energy, effective activation energy in the forward direction is 134 kilojoules per mole. So it's a modest reduction in the barrier. It's only 64 kilojoules per mole, but it's a massive increase in rate. So if you calculate at 773 Kelvin, the catalyzed reaction is 20,000 times faster. Okay? And why, why does this happen? Because the bond dissociation energy here of the CC bond is 340 uh, kilojoules per mole. But the bond dissociation energy and, uh, and of a CH bond is 420 kilojoules per mole. But the bond dissociation of an II bond is only 153 kilojoules per mole. So if we put some uh, iodine in there, I2, we break the II bond, if we apply heat, we break the II bond much more readily. So the rate of that reaction will be much faster because the activation energy barrier is lower. And we get iodine radicals. And now those radicals can abstract a hydrogen atom from the species. We get CH3CO. And you know that mechanism I showed you a little bit earlier where we were getting methane and CO. It allows that reaction to occur uh, at a faster rate because we're getting the radicals from I2 decomposition. But we're getting those because that bond dissociation energy is much lower than any of the bond dissociation energies associated with e any of the bond breaking in acid, uh, acid aldehyde. I hope I'm making it clear there what I mean. Okay. And, okay. And also we can get thermochemistry from kinetics. And I, I said that a little bit earlier. OK, so here we have ethane giving us two methyl radicals. And this has a bond dissociation energy or a heat of reaction of 368 kilojoules per mole. So the activation energy in the forward direction is 368 kilojoules per mole. That in the reverse direction is actually zero. And that's another thing to remember. When, you, when we consider reactions, two radicals reacting with one another, we use an activation energy of zero. There's no activation energy barrier for two radicals recombining. OK? It's always zero. So the heat of reaction is equal to E forward minus E reverse. So the heat of reaction is 368 kilojoules per mole. E forward is 368. E reverse is zero. So and then we, but what is the heat of reaction? It's, it's the heat of formation of products minus the heat of formation of reactants. So it's two times the heat of formation of methyl radicals minus the heat of formation of ethane. OK? So we know then that 368 kilojoules per mole is equal to two times the heat of formation of methyl minus the heat of formation of ethane. So if we know the heat of formation of ethane, which we do, which is 85 kilojoules per mole, we know the heat of reaction is 368 kilojoules per mole, we can then get the heat of formation of a methyl radical. Okay, which is 
141 kilojoules per mole. And we know then, uh, and the, the, the heat of reaction is the energy of the bond broken, which is the heat of, it's the bond association energy. So with these heats of reactions, so if we measure the heat of reaction of C2H6 giving us two methyls, or heat of reaction of C2H6 giving us ethyl plus H, we can get the bond dissociation, tables of bond dissociation energies. And that's how we do it. I said this earlier, so I'm just repeating myself again. All right. But here now you can see that we can get the heat of formation of a radical, okay, based on kinetics. Okay, and knowing the heat of formation of the stable molecule. Okay, which is good. Okay, some other, just uh, another interesting to, thing to look at. If, we, if you think of the Arrhenius equation, we have the rate constants as A e to the minus E over RT. For vapor pressure, the clausius clapeyron equation is also an Arrhenius type of equation. So we have P is equal to P infinity E to the minus delta H at constant volume over RT. And viscosity, we have the Andrad formula where we have eta is equal to A e to the plus E A over RT. Okay, which is viscosity, or if you think of the inverse, which is fluidity, fluidity is equal to fluidity at infinity times the exponent of minus Ea over Rt, which again is an Arrhenius type equation. There, and the, the only point of this slide is that they're all Arrhenius type kinetic equations. That's all. Okay. One last concept. I'm, I'm going very quickly, but I think you've all had this before. So there's no point in dwelling too long on it, um, is a simple collision theory. I want to talk a little bit about that, okay? So we have, an, uh, you're now familiar with reaction coordinate diagram, so we have reactants here, they go through a transition state and we have a product, okay? And this again is exothermic, delta H of reaction is this here and it's, we're going to get that out, okay? But what is the best geometry of approach of the two species to react? What is the most efficient way of supplying energy to overcome the transition barrier? What is the rate of movement along the reaction coordinate? Okay, and how is the, the energy distributed among the products of the reaction? Okay, so we have all of these questions associated with it. But one nice way of looking at it is simple collision theory, okay? So again, if we go back to where we started on kinetics today, we have low concentration, we have few collisions, high concentration, we have many more collisions, okay? But if we assume that molecules are hard structural spheres like billiard balls, and that there are no interactions between them until they come into contact with one another, and that they are impenetrable, and they maintain their size and shape, and they cannot come closer than their radii, then we can consider the rate at which they can collide, okay? So if we have then A and B giving us some product, we assume the molecules are hard spheres and then that every collision is reactive, then they're going to col collide along this uh, collision um, radius, nu AB, okay? So if we calculate the rate of the collision, then we get the rate of reaction. Assuming these hard spheres, that every collision is reactive and so on. No, not every collision is reactive, so we have to worry about that later, which we will. Okay, so in one second, a typical A travels a distance, D, is equal to its velocity of movement, nu AB, times T, okay? But this velocity now becomes the height of a cylinder, or a cylinder height, because in one second, then it's not a time anymore, it's actually a distance traveled, okay? So the distance is equal to VAB, or nu AB times T, and will collide with all Bs with an collision cylinder of volume pi r squared H, okay? Where nu AB is the height of the cylinder, okay? So if A is moving here in this second, in this, it'll travel this distance, 
and it would collide with all the bees that are along that cylinder in that distance in one second. I think that's fairly straightforward. Okay? So we have NB, the number of molecules of B, or particles of B, times P, pi RA plus RB squared times nu AB, collisions per second, which is the collision frequency Z, ZAB. Okay? So the collision rate, then, is going to be pi R squared H times the number of molecules or particles of A times the number of particles of B meters per meter cube per second. Okay. So if we, for simple collision theory then, if we consider the, the reaction rate is equal to the rate constant times the number of moles of A times the number of moles of B, okay, then the collision rate is equal, and also the collision rate is equal to pi r squared nu AB times the number of moles of A times the number of moles of B. Then we know that the rate constant is equal to pi r A plus r B squared times nu AB. Okay? So the rate constant is equal to this here. Okay? And that's equal to the collision cross-section sigma AB times nu AB. Okay. So where do we get this cylinder height from? How, how is it going to travel in one second? Okay, well that comes from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocity. Okay, where nu AB is equal to 8 kT over pi mu all to the power of a half, or the square root of 8 kT all over pi mu. Does that make sense? The rate at which molecules are going to move, or, or atoms or molecules are going to move, is, is directly proportional to temperature and inversely proportional to reduced mass. That makes sense. Okay? Higher temperature, they're going to move faster. Heavier, they're going to move slower. Okay? So it makes perfect sense. Okay? So where mu is equal to the, the reduced mass. MA times MB over MA plus MB. And the collision cross-section, sigma AB, is pi RA plus RB squared. Okay. So uh, practical units, we can take out all the constants, and then we can put in the variables, depending on what species we're looking at, the temperature, and then the relative molecular masses. Okay. So let's take just an example. Okay. So if we calculate... Calculation of collision rate. We calculate the mean time between collisions experienced by a single argon atom at 300 Kelvin and atmospheric pressure. The collision di diameter for argon is 0.29 nanometers, and the relative molecular mass is 0.04 kilograms per mole. Okay, so we have the collision cross-section is equal to pi Ra plus Rb squared. But in this case, it's R, the diameter squared because argon is colliding with argon, okay? And if we calculate that, and just check the numbers yourselves, you know, when you're doing it, you see it's 2.64 times 10 to the minus 19 meters squared, okay? And nu AA, which is 8 kT over pi mu, the square root of that, okay? Work that out for yourselves as well. It comes out to be 563.53 meters per second. Okay, it's the tw twice the speed of sound. Okay, so it's pretty fast. Okay, so that's the distance traveled. So this is in meters in one second. Okay, so, and then we have, we have to get the number of moles of, of A. So the number of moles of A comes out to be 40.1 moles per meter cubed, or 2.4 times 10 to the five, 25, well, molecules, this should be atoms per meter cubed. Okay, so the collision frequency then is Na, the number of atoms, number of particles of A, times the collision cross-section, times nu AA. And that comes out to be equal to 3.57 times 10 to the 9 molecules per second. Okay, and if we get the inverse of that, so the inverse would be the number of collisions per second, and that's 280 picos, sorry, the time between collisions. 
is 280 picoseconds. Okay, so that's how you do that calculation. Okay, so if we test simple collision theory and we say, right, well, let's work out the rate of reaction of methyl radical with methyl radical giving us ethane. Okay, so the relative molecular mass of methyl is 0 0.015 kilograms per mole. Let's set the temperature at 300 Kelvin and the collision diameter of a metal is 0.308 nanometers. Okay, so we know that the ray constant is equal to the collision uh, cross-section times nu AA. Okay, so we work out the collision cr cross-section is 2.98 times 10 to the minus 19, and nu AA is 920.25. Again, check the numbers yourself to see that you get the same numbers as, as I do. And that works out to be 2.745 times 10 to the minus 16 meters cubed per molecule per second, or per radical per second. If we convert that to centimeters cubed per mole per second, we calculate that to be 1.65 times 10 to the 14. Okay? Experimentally, it's measured to be 2.4 times 10 to the 13. Okay? But that's pretty close. It's within, certainly, an order of magnitude. So typically, actually, using simple collision theory, we have some sort of um, a collision efficiency times the, the um, collision frequency, okay? And here you can see the collision, or the collision efficiency is about 0.1, that only one in 10 collisions occur. Not every one is reactive. One in 10 is reactive. Okay, but this is a new, it's still quite close. You're still of the same sort of order. You know, you're within an order of magnitude of the right answer. Normally, um, the calculation is much, much greater than experiment if you do this, right? And the dependence, temperature dependence is all wrong because really all this is doing, and you probably know it if you've taken simple collision be theory before, this is just working out the rate at which they collide. So again, there's no activation energy barrier considered. It's just two species colliding together. So if I'm species A going to collide with the wall, it depends on the frequency at which I run at the wall. There's no, no need to worry. But in a lot of reactions, there's an ener energy barrier. So for the two species to react to form a product, there's an energy barrier associated with that. And so that has to be considered, okay? And so how do we improve this simple collision theory? We relax the assumption that every collision is reactive. And we say, right, well, we have a critical energy for, for reactivity. And below the critical energy, the fraction of molecules that react is zero. And above the critical energy, all of the molecules collide, okay, at or, or above it, okay? So if the collision energy is greater than or equal to the critical value, then reactions will occur, otherwise no reaction will occur, okay? So what fraction F of collisions have the energy greater than or, or equal to the collision energy? We get that from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and the fraction is equal to the exponent of minus the critical energy all over kT per molecule, or it's equal to minus the, the critical energy all over RT per mole, okay? So now we can say actually, well, the rate constant is equal to the collision cross-section times nu AB, which we get from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocity times the exponent of minus the critical energy over RT, okay? And that's, again, an Arrhenius. So this is our frequency factor here, and this is our activation energy, okay? So now the ray constant will be much smaller, assuming that we have an activation energy, okay? In the, in the example I gave, we had two methyl radicals combining, so there, there is no activation energy. So we got a pretty close answer to the right one, okay? But typically, there will be an activation energy. 
But how do we get the critical energy? Okay, and this is just a slide then showing it. And I'm, I'm probably going to, I think I'll finish on this slide for today then, okay? So if you just bear with me for this. We have, if we look at the Arrhenius equation, we have ray constant is equal to A e to the minus EA over RT. Or if we look at the simple collision theory, we have K2 is equal to the collision cross-section times the maximum Boltzmann distribution of velocities times the exponent of minus the critical energy over RT. So the question is, does EA, are EA and EC equal? Okay, and the answer is no, actually. Okay. So if we go back to the, an operational definition, we have, let, let's look at why it's not. Okay, we have the change in log K over, over the change in one over T is minus EA over R. That's, we know that from, we have the plot of log K versus one over T. Okay, so the, the slope of that is minus EA over R. And we have, then K2 is equal to this, uh, the, uh, the um, simple collision theory definition. And that's equal to some constant times T raised to the half power times the exponent of minus the critical energy over RT. So we're taking all of the constants and so on out as Y. Okay, so then we can say, well, log K is equal to half log T minus E, the critical energy over RT plus log Y. Okay, we're just integrating or getting the log of everything. Okay, so we have log K then is equal to minus a half log one over t. So the, this is the same, we've just put everything one over it, the, okay? Minus the e critical over r times one over t plus log y. So then we can say, right, d log k all over d times one over t is equal to minus a half t minus ec over r. And now we know that this is equal to minus ea over r from the Arrhenius equation. Okay, each step. So we know now that E critical then is equal to EA minus RT over two. Okay, so actually we have K2 is equal to um, this expression here, and it's actually equal to the activation energy over t RT. It's equal to everything except times E to the minus a half. Okay, so this relates EC and EA. I hope it's clear. I've done it out fairly straightforwardly there for you in each step, okay? But that, that rates the activation energy with the critical energy from simple collision theory, okay? And I, I like the simple collision theory. And again, I didn't put it in the slide, I should have, but just remember that not every reaction or every collision is reactive. And so typically what you calculate is too much and you have to put in some sort of um, an efficiency factor. And typically that efficiency factor is less than one. Okay, so you get a value, some fraction times your frequency factor. Okay, thanks for your time. Just, just remember, tomorrow morning I would really like to, it would be very instructive for you guys if I spent the first hour just going maybe more, depending on how we get on, just going through therm. So try and uh, download term today and get it running on your computer so that we can use it tomorrow. Okay, thanks. <laughs>